Beautiful. Shoo! Mm -mm -mm. What's up to our online crowd? Let's give it up for everybody joining us online right now. Always a few hundred people on there watching with us, which is beautiful. And uh, many of them watch online. First, many of you did that. You, you check it out online before you come see it in person. So uh, we can't wait to meet you guys when you're ready in person. Um, oh, gosh. Whew. I hope you feel it. I hope you feel it. I, say, I, I said this last service, I'm going to say it again. I think that um, if you are a part of, of building this church and you've been here for a little bit, and even if you've been here for just a couple of weeks, I hope you just feel what God is doing here. And, uh, and just pinch yourself with gratitude for getting to be a part of it. I, I'm pinching myself that I get to be your pastor and get to see um, God do this. It's, it's just crazy. You, you, you just have to know. Last Sunday I went home and I was like, we had 18 baptisms, boom in attendance, newcomers left and right, God doing amazing things. We're meeting needs in the community. And I thought, man, I know churches in our country that would beg to have what happened last Sunday happen in an entire year. If they could write their annual reports and say, we had what we experienced in a day, you need to understand that is not normal. You should never come to just take for granted what God is doing here, right? We're a part of building something. I hope you feel it. I hope you see it. I hope you're um, just filled up by it, man. I, ho I hope you're filled up by it because I know I am, man. It's, it's beautiful. A um, couple things to put on your calendar before we jump in. Uh, we do have a lot going on, man. It's a great time to be in on the Peak City world. Uh, we got small groups that are about to open up. We got nearly 40 small groups that are opening at the beginning of September, which is beautiful. It's a chance for you to grow and get connected and uh, take this stuff that we're learning and actually apply it to your life, right? We say all the time, you don't need more content. You need accountability in your life to live out the content that you hear. Our world is filled with content. Right? You can download a, a book a second right now and you wouldn't cover all the Christian books out there. You don't need more content. You need to apply it, and that's what groups do. So all those are opening uh, in early September. You'll hear more about that then. Um, but then also just want to put on your calendar too. We're going to, in September, drop the dates for something brand new that we're doing called Peak City Community Nights. And uh, this is going to be a time for us to like, get together and hang and have fun <laughs> and make some friends. I think in the post-COVID world, everybody's forgotten how to have fun and make friends. Right? And so we just need to like enjoy each other and enjoy this life we've been given. So we're going to have like a men's community night, women's community night, a young adult community night, and then a family community night. Just a chance for you to get together with other people that are in your same kind of season, same stage of life, and uh, have some fun. We'll have some fun. Uh, they, they've, they've all got little wrinkles to them that you will find hilarious and fun. So um, buckle up for that. Community nights are coming. All right? Um, if you have a Bible, get to John chapter 2. We're in John 2. If you don't have a Bible, no sweat. We'll have the words on the screen for you. If you need a Bible, man, I had a really cool call with someone this week who had been to our church and he was like, hey, I need, a, I need to request a favor from you. And I was like, oh, no. Because uh, and you just never know, man. Like, you never know. You never know what kind of weird stuff people will ask for. And he was like, can you, like, help me find a Bible? Like, I don't, I don't own a Bible. I don't even know where to start. I'm like, that's a beautiful thing, man. If you need a Bible, let us know. We got you. We'll, we'll figure it out, man. Uh, head to the info bar, shoot us an email, something. Um, my message today, the title of my message is, There is a Better View. All right, there is a better view. Um, I told you all back in June that my family was going to attempt to become a camping family. And um, attempt we did, okay? We went camping in July. We uh, went up to the crags. You know, like we're not like a Colorado family. Like we're, we're just becoming an outdoorsy Colorado family, right? We're transplants. And so we don't know what we're doing. Uh, but my wife, I convinced her. She was very opposed to it, but I convinced her. And we, we went camping. And it went great. It went great. If, if, if you've ever been to the crags, the crags are behind Pikes Peak. Very easy, cool place to camp. And, uh, and it went great. Except for a few things, like um, we got there and within an hour, our kids found a creek and all of their clothes, shoes, and socks were soaking wet and we didn't bring enough change of clothes. That wasn't good. But it was great. It was a great time. Um, except for then at night at like 3 a.m., we underestimate how cold it gets in Colorado at night up in the mountains and all of our kids were freezing and we had to bring them all into our tent with us, sleeping with us, and no one got any sleep. But it was awesome. It was a great experience. And then... You know, one more little thing went wrong. Then we laid out the clothes that got wet to dry out, right? Like you dry out. We got dry weather. It's like, the, it's like the desert out here. It should dry out the clothes. Then we realized when we woke up that Mountain Dew is not just a drink. It is real. And everything was wet. Sopping wet. But it was awesome. Camping was the best. It was just so good. It was a great experience. No. My wife is still in. We're going to become a camping family. It's great. I'm, I'm super pumped about that. Um, but... 
Camping with kids is the worst. It is 100% the worst. Um, when I tried to take them on a hike, like if you've been to the crags, you know it's just easy. It's like, it's just a little path. It's like a mile long and you get to this amazing view and there's no uphill. It's not rocky. It's just easy. And halfway through the kids are like, ugh, like act like they're on the Oregon Trail, 1883 style, like about to die. I'm like, my God, can we just make it? I'm like, guys, I promise you, if you will push a little further, there is a better view, all right? There's a better view. And, and finally they made it through and we finally got to this beautiful view where everything clears out. You can go throw up there. And the kids were like, wow. Dad, it was worth it. I was like, yeah, it was. You just got to trust me. You got to put in a little effort. You got to put in a little work. And there is a better view. All right, I think what God wants to do in your heart today, and I think what I saw him do in first service, is I think he wants to take you today, no matter if you're new to faith, not even really sure what you believe about God yet, or if you grew up in church, you've been a person of faith all your life. I think he wants to lift you up and take you to a better view. All right, I think he wants you to see your life, to see God, and to see what he's doing in the world from a better vantage point, to have a much, much better view of God and what he's doing in the world. But I gotta tell you, that better view, it will not come easy. You're gonna have to push a little bit. You're gonna have to push through some exhaustion. You're gonna have to push through some uncomfortability, right? But if you'll push through it, there is a better view. All right, there's a better view. John chapter two, y'all ready? All right, <clears throat> remember, 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 when I say y'all, are y'all ready? I'm not asking for hype. I'm asking, do you believe that Jesus in, is in the room and wants to teach you today? We just sang and went nuts about the resurrection. Do you believe that God is alive and he's active and he didn't want you to come to church just to check some stupid religious box? He brought you to church because he wants to teach you and grow. He wants to teach me and grow me. So when I say, are you ready? It's, are you ready to receive from God, not from some stupid preacher? So are you ready? Much better. <clears throat> John chapter two, verse one, we starting at a wedding and weddings get wild. Y'all know that weddings can get wild. Some weddings are just lame, but some weddings get wild. This one's going to get wild. <clears throat> John chapter two, verse one, it says on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee and Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. How kind. When the wine was gone, uh-oh. When the wine was gone. Y'all know when the, when the drinks stop flowing, people stop doing stupid things on the dance floor and the party ends, right? When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. He had not done a, a, he had not done a single public miracle yet. N no one knew that he was capable of even addressing this problem, but, but his mama knew. Right, his mama knew. His mother said to the servants, she kind of ignored Jesus' whole pushback, and she turns to the servants, and she, and she says, just do whatever he tells you to do. Right? Mama knew. And mamas always know, don't they? Like you, you mamas in the house, you know. You know more about your kids than anybody else. Right? And mamas have this, like, this uh, belief in their children it's a very optimistic belief, right? Like dads are very pessimistic towards their kids. Like, I don't know if they're going to make it, you know? But moms are like, no, they got more in them, right? Because you brought this child into the world. You raised this child. You saw him become a teenager. You watched him become a young adult. You see him at their best and their worst. And you know that they're capable of more. See, Jesus' mama knew. See, she knew. She had seen. Though Jesus had not done a single, a single public miracle, that does not mean he had not done anything in private, Right? She had seen what he was capable of, and she knew with this problem that he was able to do more. And I feel like for some of us in the room, you need to understand there is a small word in there about how faith works. Right? Faith, you see, there is, a, there, there is a concept that you need to understand that when the devil is attacking your mind, when the devil is attacking your faith, he primarily attacks it by getting you to believe in a pessimistic mindset. Right? The devil is a pessimist. The devil is the one that's in your ear saying, yeah, yeah, God did it for you in the past, but he's probably not going to do it in the future. You know, some of you, you can tell, some of you could get up and grab the mic right now and get on stage and tell a story about God's faithfulness in your life. That song ain't just a song, it's a testimony, right? You could tell a story about how God has changed your life. He's freed you from addiction. He's restored your marriage. He's brought you out of depression. He's healed your mental health issues. Like he has done amazing things, but there's a devil inside of you that says, yeah, 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 yeah. He did it before, but your best days are probably behind you, right? Many of us, we don't pray with faith. We don't pray with optimism. We don't pray believing that God is capable of doing more. And you need to understand, God does not respond to pessimistic faith. 
God does not respond to, well, if you could, I don't know, maybe, if you will. No, Mary says, He's, I've, seen him, I've seen him do too much, and I believe he can do more. You ain't got wine, my boy can take care of you. And Jesus may push back on it a little bit, but notice he responds to it, right? If you would start praying with more confidence and more faith that God is able to do what we, what we say in the Bible, right? It's in the Bible, this is New Testament stuff. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than anything we could ever ask for or imagine according to his power at work within us. God is able to do more, and you have to believe it. You have to see it, and you have to pray with confidence. And when, when God sees that, he's like, all right, let's go. If you think I can do more, I'm about to show you I can do more, right? Mary says, oh, he can do more, and God responds to optimistic faith. Look what happens. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, and each holding from 20 to 30 gallons, big old jars. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet, the the wedding planner, right, the wedding coordinator, he tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he didn't realize where it had come from. You got to hold on to that verse. We're going to come back to it. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. Hold that one. Fold it up. Put it in your pocket. We'll come back to it. Then he called the bridegroom aside. And he said, everyone brings out the choice wine first. And then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. You say the best, oh, I'm telling you, this passage, just this little chunk right here, it is filled to the brim like these jars with riches. There's so much that God wants to teach you in this. There's so much he wants to show you in this. I'm telling you, God, God, God puts so much into these little, little passages, right? The, 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 the master of the banquet, the, the wedding coordinator, he's shocked when he tastes this wine and it's the best wine he's ever had in his life. And he's shocked because the master of the banquet, he ain't no chump. Right? He knows how to make a wedding cost effective for the family, right? And the way you make a wedding cost effective for the family is you bring out the best wine first, let them have a little too much, and then bring out the $2 Trader Joe's bottles. <laughs> Y'all trying to act like a pastor don't know where to get cheap alcohol. <laughs> Pastors are bargain hunters, man. We deal hunters. All right. <laughs> Guarantee you go in that Trader Joe's, <laughs> Trader Joe's liquor store, you're going to see a couple pastors in there at all times. All right. You bring out the good stuff first, then you bring out the, the cheap stuff. And he goes, whoa, 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 you guys did it opposite. You brought out the good stuff, and then you brought out the best. It's like, I've never, I've never even tasted wine this good. See, and he doesn't know where it came from, right? He doesn't know where it came from. But what he's experiencing right now is this universal truth that you need to hear and you need to understand, right? He, he had tasted good wine, and then he says, you brought out the best. It was the wine that God had touched. It was what came from God. You see, you need to understand, like my boy Chance the Rapper says, God is better than the world's best thing. You see, God is better than the best thing that this world has to offer, I think, I think Christians, sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot the way we talk about God and talk about faith. And I get it. It comes from a pure place. Like sometimes we talk about faith. It's like, man, I can't imagine anybody living apart from Jesus. Their, their life must be miserable. And it's because you've experienced such goodness with God, right? The problem is, let me, let me peel back the curtain for you. I got many friends that don't believe in Jesus. And let me tell you, their lives are not miserable. You're like, Pastor just said that in church. Can you say that? Uh-huh. They're living a good life. They're making money. They're experiencing purpose, they're married, they're experiencing love. We act as if there is no goodness apart from God. But you understand, God is so good, he will allow you to experience his goodness, he will allow you to to experience love and joy and passion and purpose, even if you don't believe in him, he's that good to you. There is a general goodness that you have been like grandfathered into just because you were created by God. Right? There are good things we experience in this world. The problem is the devil gets you to settle for good when God has best in mind. Right? That, that guy had tasted good wine. He had never tasted anything like what God did. See, some of you, some of you out there, you have tasted purpose. Oh, you've tasted purpose. Right? And you don't even believe in Jesus yet. You're not even sure if you're a person of faith yet. This might be your first time in church, but you've felt purpose before. You've used your gifts. You've used your abilities to help people, and it's so fulfilling, and it's so rewarding. That's so good. But let me tell you, you have never experienced purpose until you've let God touch it, 
until you've let God into your life, until you've seen that, oh my gosh, the gifts that he's put in me are from him and he's called me to do things for him. I'm telling you, until you wake up in the morning and you say, I don't work for man today, I work for God today, you ain't experienced purpose. It's God's best. You are settling for good when you could be experiencing the best. Some of you, you got a good marriage. You're in a good dating relationship and you're experiencing love. Whoo, love's good, ain't it? Love's intoxicating. It's great. You don't have to believe in God to experience love, but you have never experienced true love until you've experienced love that is rooted from a sacrificial standpoint, that is rooted in the fact that Jesus stretched his arms out on a cross to die for you. He sacrificed everything for you and now you're gonna love your partner. You're gonna love your spouse from that sacrificial love. That's God's best. That's where the good stuff is found. You think that wine was good? You ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't tasted the best. I got a buddy, a um, friend of mine who has used drugs most of his life. And um, he, he used drugs originally because he was just addicted to it. And he's grown to a place now where most, most times in his life, he's just using drugs rec- 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 recreationally, right? Weed, shrooms, whatever. And, and he's like, you know, I, I love doing it because it gets me um, to feel a feeling of relief, right? I feel lighter when I'm high. I feel lighter when I'm doing, and so like the burdens of my, of my life don't feel as heavy on me. But you know what he said to me a couple weeks ago? He said, Peter, what I'm realizing is that is the devil tricking me with something good when I could have something that's best. He said, because what I've experienced now is when I sit alone with God and I understand his love for me. I understand that he knows everything about me, but yet he loves me all the same and he forgives me all the same. He was like, you know what? I experience a better high in that moment than I ever get from weed. I'm taking a cheap substitute and I'm being tricked with good when I could have God's best. See, some of you, God's got so much more. If you would let God into your life, if you'd let him touch your intellect, if you'd let him touch your work ethic, I'm telling you, some of y'all got great work ethic. You ain't seen nothing until you allow God to teach you how to really work hard. You need to let God into your life, let God into your life, and you experience the best. That's what the, that's what the, the wedding corner, the, the master of the banquet, he's, he's tasting. He doesn't even know it yet. But he is tasting something that God has touched, that God has created. And it's so much better than anything he's ever experienced. But he has no freaking clue where it came from. He thinks that this best wine came from the generosity of the family of the groom. He's like, y'all are the most generous people in the world. He ain't got no clue it came from God. Right? Again, back up to that one little verse. I told you to fold it away. It's my favorite verse in this whole passage. It says, he, the wedding the wedding, the, the, the banquet master. He didn't realize where the wine had come from. He didn't realize it. But, right, the servants, the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. They knew. See, he, the view he had of what had happened, it just wasn't the right view. It wasn't the best view. It's not that it was a bad view necessarily, because, right, he was blown away with gratitude. He sees that this family, he thinks that this family brought out the most expensive wine last. And he's just like, whoa, you guys are generous. Right? He's, he's amazed. And his view is pretty good. But it ain't the best view. It ain't the best view. I'm telling you, there's a better view. But you need to understand in the, in the kingdom of God, in the economy of God, you must understand this, that servants always get the best view. Servants are always the ones who get to see the most. They're always the ones who get to know the inner workings of what's really happening in God's kingdom. It's always the ones who will do whatever Jesus told them to do. It's always the ones who will work behind the scenes. It's always the ones who will grind and do the nitty gritty dirty work. They always get the best view. See, you've got a pretty good view, right? Like your view ain't bad. Let me, let, let me, let me take you to church world for a second. Um, when we talk about see the need, right? I love, I love, I love that God, has, God is leading us to do this. I love celebrating these things with you every week. I just feel like it's like, like hands and feet of Jesus, like it's the church, you know? And you've got a pretty good view sitting where you are. Right? You sit where you are, and I get up here and I say, man, let's celebrate. We provided a family with a washer and dryer. We, we provided 100 kids with back-to-school clothes and back-to-school supplies. We, you know, we, 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 we paid for a single mom to have her car repaired. And it's like, yeah, that's awesome. That's a good view. You know who has the best view, though? It ain't you. You know who has the best view? It's the family walking alongside that family. It's the family who walks alongside and says, hey, I know them. (laughs) And I see their struggle. And I see their pain. And let me 
let me reach out and try to help them. And then they get to walk alongside. It's not like the church sends me or Derek to go, no, 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 we supply it with you and you go. That's the people, the servants always get the best view. They always do. Baptisms, baptisms. Y'all had a pretty dang good view last week. I mean, when Kira came out of the water, baptized with her hands raised in the air, I was about to lose my mind crying. I mean, he's like, it's unbelievable. In this service alone, if you're here for the love of we had we had two people in the first service, and it was beautiful. We had 16 in this service that got baptized. Whew. It was wild. I had someone come up to me afterwards, and they said, I've been in church all my life, and I've never been a part of a service that was that electric. I've never been a part of a service where I felt the spirit of God moving like that. It was, un- it was unreal. You got a pretty good view, but you know who's got the best view? It ain't you. It ain't you. You know who's got the best view? The prayer team that receives people when they walk through the doors back there to make that decision, and they pray with people and make sure they, they understand what they're doing and then they pray for them. It's, it's the people who are, who are helping them get their right shorts and shirt sizes and towels and get dried off. It's the people who are in the back that are seeing the emotion behind the moment and they're hearing the stories. I'm telling you, servants get the best view. Last, last week, I was back, I was in the bathroom stall last week and there are two, in our first service, there was a father and a son that got baptized. All I knew is that the son was getting baptized, right? But we're all getting changed in our separate stalls, and there's people that are helping all around. And the people that were helping got to hear this conversation where the dad spoke up out of nowhere. And he goes, hey, Petey, um, I'm like, yeah. He's like, I haven't been baptized myself. And I'm like, well, do you want to? And he's like, because of my son and his faith, yeah, I do. I'm ready. The son led the father to make that decision, not vice versa. Yeah. But you'd have never known. You ain't got the best view. <laughs> Servants always get the best view. And I'm telling you, in this culture, we live in this culture. And it, like, let me step outside of, of, of church world for a second. Let's just talk culture. We live in a culture that is obsessed and hell-bent on consuming. Everything in your life you attend, you observe, and you consume. Your kid's school, you go to all those functions and you attend, observe, consume, and evaluate. Critique, let me use the better word. In your workplace, most oftentimes, you are just sitting back and observing, waiting on your boss to figure out what they're going to do. You'll just do whatever they do. You attend, you observe, you consume. You attend, you observe, you consume. We go, to, we go out with our friends, right? Hanging out on a Friday night, on a Thursday night. What do you do? You show up somewhere and you observe, you attend, you consume. Our culture is hell-bent on turning you into just a consumer. Gimme, 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 gimme. And I think it's robbing you of life. It's robbing you of the gift of life. I'm telling you, forget church for a second. You should find what you are passionate about and you should reject the spirit of consumerism with everything you have and you should become a builder. You should start contributing. You should start getting your hands dirty. You should start getting on the front lines and you would get the best view in the house to whatever it is that you're passionate about. Servants always, always, always get the best view. It's never the people who sit back and consume. So obviously, yeah, yeah, back to church world. Easy, easy, easy. I think you should join a serving team here, 100%. We got people that serve here nonstop. Right? We got people on production team, we got people in kids ministry, people on connections and greeting, we got people that serve throughout the week and, and do, uh, do data. I mean, there's all kinds of like administrators. There's, there's something for every commitment level, every talent, every gifting. There's, there's space for everyone. Of course, I think you should join a team because <laughs> I see it every single week. I see the view that our volunteers get every single week. Right? If you want a view to what God's doing, you should serve. Three weeks ago, I, I was having one of those like pinch myself moments and I'm like, oh man, I can't believe what God's doing here. This is crazy. And I wanted, I wanted to just get a, like a full view of it, right? So normally I'm front row. I went to the back of the room and I was just watching y'all worship. I was just watching what God was doing. And I was just thanking God that I get to be a part of it. And I saw something. See, y'all were just worshiping, which is what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Words are on the screen, bands going, sounds awesome, everything's great. What you don't know is that everything that could go wrong that morning with our tech went wrong. But you have no idea, it just looked normal. That's because a bunch of volunteers were working their butts off from 6 a.m. to nine. I'm telling you, I've been in ministry long enough to know that the devil loves to mess with technology. (laughs) I've seen 
really expensive systems work all week long and then mysteriously, miraculously shut down at 9 and 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. I've seen it. And I watched our volunteers just work and serve and and patch problems. And I mean, they're running all over the place trying to fix it just so you can have a very distraction-free worship experience. And I went to the back of the room and I, I caught a picture of one of our volunteers. And I said, this is the best view. That's the best view. Working a camera for the online crowd. And he's like, you know what, the online crowd, they're going have to have to be satisfied with the still shot because i got to lift my hands in worship right now. Yeah. That's the best view in the house. You want to see God at work? You ought, to do, you ought to serve. You ought to get involved. You ought to stop just consuming, consuming, consuming. The best view in the house is always for the servants. And, 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 and when, I was, when I was processing through this this week, when I was like letting God work this over in my heart and my soul to make sure that I am living it out, he, he, he kept putting this line in my head, this line in my head, is that God is always working in your life. He is. But your view is up to you. God is working in your life. But your view of it is up to you. Every single weekend, he is working. Every single weekend, he's showing up. Every single weekend, there are people coming through these doors that are far from God and they're finding hope and they're finding Jesus. I'm telling you, God is working in your life, in in people's lives all around you. But your view is up to you. You choose whether or not you will just consume and observe and attend or whether or not you will build, right? And I think today you need to make the choice to stop consuming and start contributing to be a part of it. I think you should do it here at at this church because I think that the local church is God's plan A to rescue the world and there is no plan B. But if you don't want to do it here, that's fine. Figure out what you're passionate about and stop consuming. Build, build, build. Get on the front lines and watch God work in your life. Watch him, watch him do unbelievable things. And I know like, I know when I say this that some of you right now are like feeling like I punched you. Right, you're feeling like um, defensive because you have served in the church before and you have been burnt. I know a lot of your stories, and I know that some of y'all were involved in church. Some of y'all were involved in other churches, and you got burnout. Your your commitment got taken advantage of. You got treated poorly, and you got church hurt, and church hurt is real. I also know there's some people in this room right now who used to serve like crazy at this church, and you got burnt. You got taken advantage of. You got hurt. I've heard your stories. I know. And so I just want to say this as gently as I can because I want you to feel like I'm beating you up. If you've been hurt and wounded by the church before, you should absolutely take a season to rest. You should. And this is a safe place to do it. You should come in and just breathe for a little bit. (sighs) Rest for a little bit. Let God heal some of your wounds. But let me push you a little bit. Right? When an athlete gets injured, there is a season to sit around with the cast on and do nothing. But you know that season is shorter than you are ever comfortable with. You know those PTs, what they do, they want to get you what? Moving. They want to get you going. See, if you've been hurt by the church, if you've been burnt out by the church, if, you've been, if your commitment has been abused and taken advantage of, you should breathe, 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 but you shouldn't let it go for longer than a season. Because what your heart really needs is to get back on the front lines and see God's mercy change someone's life. That's what you need. You want to heal from the church hurt? Watch God's mercy and grace change a life again. And you got to get on the front row. You've got to get a better view to do so. I had, a, <clears throat> I had an old pastor that I got the chance to spend a little bit of time with several years ago. And um, <laughs> he had like old man wisdom. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you old men in the room, you know what I'm talking about, Right? Anytime you get around someone young, like you got some good wisdom given, and it sounds great. Like you got great wisdom. Like I can't wait to be old enough to give wisdom that sounds like old man wisdom. I think it'd be awesome. Not there yet. I say stuff now, and people are like, "Huh, I'm not sure if I believe you." There's just something with age. You say something, it's like even if it, even if even if it makes no sense, right? it's like a Clint Eastwood gravity to it. And uh, I asked him, I was like, "And he, this is a guy who had grown his church like very steadily over 30 years. He pastored the same church for 30 years." And he said that his church never grew by more than like 6 or 7% a year. But by the end, you know, when we started, church was a few hundred. By the end, it was 20,000. And uh, I was like, man, what would you tell a young pastor like me that's just like trying to figure things out? Like, give me some advice. And he said, uh, 
He said, well, first thing I'd tell you, he's a real country guy. First thing I'd tell you is, life is too short to have a bad seat at a ball game. And I was like, like sitting there like, explain the parable. <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> I don't know quite what you're saying right now. <laughs> and he's like, well, I just think, man, people spend too much money on these tickets these days. And they could just get a better view by sitting at home watching TV. And you, know, you, should, you should save up your money so you can buy a real good seat. Like if you go to a ball game, life's too short to have a bad seat at a ball game. I was like, that's it? No, there's no church meeting in there? He's like, nah, man, it's just about sports. <laughs> I was like, how did you grow a church to 20,000 again? But it's all good. God loves you. Um, but man, it's so funny because I was writing this message, I couldn't get that story out of my head. I couldn't get that wisdom out of my head. And I, I think there's probably more to it than I was even getting in the moment, right? It's like, man, life is too short for you to have a bad seat for what God is doing in this world. Life is too short for you to sit on the sidelines and consume and observe and critique. Life is too short. God is working. And you could see it. You could, you could see all of it. If you just get up off your butt, there's a better view. But it will require you to push past the uncomfortability. It will require you to put effort. It will require you to put some time in. It will, it will require you to do some stuff that, that is way below your pay grade. You, you know, we got people out here that hold the doors that lead very, very big businesses in this community. It's way below their pay grade. But they get a front row seat to seeing what God is doing. Right? You got to push past that uncomfortability. I'm telling you, life is too short for you to just sit there. I, 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 think, we're, I think many of us are going to get to heaven one day, and we're going to hear story after story after story of the goodness of God. All these life change things that are happening around us. And some of us are going to go, I was alive and with you, and I had no idea. <laughs> it's because you didn't have a good view. And so maybe today what you need to do is you need to commit yourself to following the way of Jesus. You know that's all I'm talking about, right? The, the way of serving, the way of not just consuming, but of, of serving is the way of Jesus. Philippians 2 puts it like this. It says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very, very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he lowered himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. But once he did that, once he lowered himself, once he did the nitty gritty, once he washed our feet, once he stretched his arms out on the cross, once he became a servant, look what happened. God exalted him to the highest place. What a view to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a view. That's a view. And God gave him that view when he chose to be a servant, when he chose to reject the spirit of consumerism, when he chose to reject the spirit of observation, and he said, no, 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 I'm going to lean in. I'm going to get my hands dirty. I'm going to serve. So maybe today you just need to confess that to God that you've lived too much of your life, whether it's your first time or you've been in church all your life. Every single one of us are in the same boat. We live in the same culture. Forget how long you've been to church. Forget what you believe right now. We're all in the same boat. We are all subject to this American spirit of consumerism. And what we need to do is we need to confess it and repent of it and run away from it. So let's do that. Would you stand with me to your feet? We give you a chance every week to make a decision before God. This is not about, you know, bragging about your faith. This is not about trying to be showy. That's why we tell everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. So why don't you go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes to give people privacy. This is a decision between you and God. And if you know, if you know that you have been, you've fallen prey to this spirit of consumerism. You've been observing and attending and critiquing everything in your life. And you know it's robbing you of life. If you know that's where you are today and you wanna just confess that to God and you wanna make a commitment to him that you're gonna start serving. Whether that's at church, maybe it's in your friend group. You just need to go, go into your friend group and start serving more and stop, stop worrying about them meeting your needs. Why don't you start meeting their needs? Maybe you need to make the decision to go home to your marriage and start serving your spouse sacrificially. 
Maybe it's that, you know, when you're going back into the hallways of school this week and next week, you ain't looking to see what other people can do for you. You're looking to serve. You're looking to serve. If you want to confess that to God that you have been a consumer and you are going to reject that spirit and you want to start contributing and building and serving, if you want to make that commitment before God today, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Hands up all over the room. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm, awesome. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, we know that what we have just done is we have gone against the attacks of the devil, that he has set forth in our culture sneaky lies that he has put into our hearts and our souls. And God, right now, we want to flush them out. We want to call them out for what they are. We reject the spirit of consumerism, God. We don't want to be like every other person in our culture right now. God, we need you to change our hearts. We need you to help us model our lives after your son, Jesus, the one who served, the one who gave his all for us, the one who stretched his arms out on the cross and died for us. Give us his spirit, his mindset, God. May we take on the mindset of Jesus Christ and be servants in our community, be servants in our church, and then we'll watch you do the rest, Jesus. We love you and we trust you. And it's in Jesus' name we all pray together by saying...